In JavaScript or Python, it takes just a few lines of code to download and parse data from a web service. But how about C++? Well, with the right tools, it's also pretty easy. Combining the flexibility of the Niels Lohmann JSON library with the power of the WX Widgets framework, we can turn this into this in just a couple of minutes and build a native app that works on Windows, Mac and Linux without any code changes. Let's quickly go through the UI construction. We have our fancy bitmap gallery control we built in the animations tutorial. Next, the labels for the product name and other properties, like price, brand and category. The description field and navigation buttons are below. A vertical sizer manages our UI elements, ensuring they stretch correctly. The labels are organized in a grid, with items on the left aligned to the right and items on the right aligned to the left, making the whole thing nicely centered. The buttons are declared locally and contained in a horizontal sizer. At this point, the app is not loading anything. The stretching works correctly though, which is a good start. To display data, we need to download it from somewhere. DummyJSON is a helpful website providing realistic web endpoints, emulating a product catalog with item metadata and working image links. To download this, we will use the WX Web Request class, which is available in WX widgets from version 3.15, so we need to ensure we use that release or newer, for example, the stable 3.2.2 version. We must also explicitly state that we want to use the net component. Additionally, for Linux, we must link with the curl library, which is super easy to do in CMake. On Windows or Mac, WX widgets uses system libraries for HTTP connections, but on Linux they use curl. So, apart from linking it in CMake, we need to ensure that the curl development package is installed in the system. Now that everything is configured, let's create a simple request and download something. The request object lives in our class as a member variable. This will become important when we implement the correct cleanup when quitting the application. Here's our URL with the JSON we want to download. To do this, we create a web request using a particular factory method and check if this method is completed successfully. Then, we bind the handler for the request status change event. This is the place where we can examine the response. For now, we simply print the response body. Finally, we call start on our request object and run the app. The important thing is that our web request runs on the background thread. We start it in the main thread, and the event handler code is also executed on the main thread, but the download itself happens in the background. And here's our response. Now we need to parse it. JSON is a straightforward text format used everywhere on the web. It organizes the data in a simple hierarchical structure. It begins with a dictionary, which is indicated by the presence of curly braces. Each element in the dictionary has a key, which is always a string, and a value of some type. Strings, booleans, numbers and even dictionaries and arrays are possible. The square bracket denotes arrays. This object type can contain an ordered list of other objects, such as dictionaries or strings. Finally, there is the null object, indicating an empty value. One of the most popular libraries for parsing JSON in C++ is Niels Lohmann's JSON for modern C++. Its basic usage is really simple. First, we need to call the parse method, which returns a basic JSON object. Selecting different keys and indices returns another object containing only the requested data. Here, the products JSON object contains the full products array, and the first product is a dictionary representing the first one from that list. We can get the product's title, value and assign it to a standard string, just like that. We can even be more direct, like this. If the type of the JSON value is indeed a string, the library will do all the type conversions for us. Or we can call the get method, providing the type in the template parameter. We can iterate over dictionaries using the items method which returns the proper iterator object. 
Extracting the numbers is also very simple. Finally, we can iterate over the array or store the entire collection in a vector, just like this. The library can be downloaded as a single header and included in our main file. With CMake, we can make this process automatic, provide the URL for the release to download it using fetch content. Then we add it to the library's list. If you are using Visual Studio Code, adding the library location to the include pad list is helpful to make the IntelliSense work correctly. Let's use this library to parse the JSON. First, we prepare the product class. This will be our model containing the product properties we want to display. We return to the main file and prepare the code to display the products in the UI. We will keep our objects in a vector and increase or decrease the current index in the navigation button's click callbacks. The refresh current product function updates the UI controls with the properties of the selected product, except for the images, which we will handle later. Finally, with the UI mechanics in place, we parse the incoming JSON by calling the parse method. We select the product key and iterate over its value to get to the product list. Now the construction of the product object is straightforward. We get the value for each field using the square bracket operator. Then it's just a matter of adding the products to our list, resetting the index and refreshing the UI. Our window is now populated with everything except the images. Navigation works as expected and we are on the right track. Loading the images for each product will be more complex. We will start with a simple URL queue containing the list of image addresses. After removing the first item from the queue, we will start the request and wait for its completion. Then, we will add the bitmap and repeat the operation only if there are URLs left in the queue. As we will see later, this is too simple to handle real-life scenarios. But let's not get too far ahead of ourselves. First, let's see how this simple flowchart translates to code and implement it by creating the bitmap loader class.
Alright, here's the result. The images are loading, we can switch between them and we can trigger the loading of the following item's photos using the navigation buttons. Here's the problem. If we navigate quickly, we get the images mixed up. As we can see, this product displays photos of two different brands of laptops, which is incorrect. When navigating to a different image, we don't wait for the current request to be completed. We just start a new one. When the old requests finish, they add the wrong images to the current product. To fix this, we won't be starting the image download immediately after the user clicks a navigation button. Instead, we will store the next batch of image URLs in the bitmap loader, cancel the current request and start the new download in the request callback after the framework confirms the cancellation. Here's the updated flowchart. After getting the request status, we check if the next batch of URLs is waiting for us. If not, we proceed normally, adding the bitmap to the gallery and popping the next element from the queue. However, if the next batch is ready, we indicate that the process has finished by setting the is idle to true and we start with the new batch. That start method is also run when the user navigates to a different product. So, before we do anything, we need to check if any requests are working. If the loader is idle, we proceed normally, resetting the bitmap view and populating the queue. But if there is some request working in the background, we set the next batch and cancel that request. That triggers the callback. There, we check for the next batch, see that it is prepared and start again without any pending requests. Let's implement these changes in the code and see if that helps. Now everything works correctly. Images do not get mixed up, no matter how fast we navigate. And if we examine the logs, we see that pending requests get cancelled before the download for the next item starts. The last thing to do is to clean up everything correctly. We cannot let the request hang around when we quit the application, so we must ensure they are cancelled. In the official WX web request sample, they do that by calling cancel in the onClose event. Then the web request event handler assigns an empty object to the request variable. This empty object will return false from the isOK method. That's why they check that method in the destructor, only allowing the application to close once the cancellation is confirmed. The WX yield call is needed here to allow the status event to arrive. One may argue that this is rather ugly. Also, this implementation has a problem on Linux when the network is slow. The cancel call in all close tends to block, causing the UI to freeze and making the app unresponsive. Let me propose a different solution. First, let's clean up the main web request in our app which downloads the products JSON. The quit requested variable will indicate that the app is in the process of closing and is waiting for the framework to confirm the cancellation of the web request. To handle the closing of the app, we need to bind a handler to the onClose event. In the handler's body, we check if the request is active 
and if so, we set the quit requested flag to true. We then hide the window and cancel the request. To mitigate the problem with the window freezing, we wrap that call in call after, so that it will be executed in the next event loop after the hide call has had the chance to hide the window. If there are no active requests, we call skip, letting the framework use the default behavior for closing the window. At some point, we will get the state change event, so we update the callback to check if the quit requested flag is set to true. If that's the case, and we just got the cancellation confirmation, we call close. This will trigger the onClose event again, but there will be no active request this time, and the window will close normally. We need to do a similar thing in the bitmap loader. The finish callback function will be called when the loader manages to cancel the current image load request. The client class can provide this function as an argument to this cancel all method. Here we reset the queue, set the callback, and call the cancel method on our request. Going back to the main class, we add another if branch in the onClose method, checking if the bitmap loader is still running. Just like with the JSON request, we call cancel, but this time we provide the callback, which will be executed by the loader when the cancellation is completed. In that callback, we close the window, completing our cleanup procedure. Let's check out how this all works with a slow network. If we close the window before the products are loaded, the onClose method enters the first if branch, as the JSON request is still active. After the request is cancelled, we get to the status callback and are able to finalize the procedure and exit the app. Similarly, for the bitmap loader, again with the slow network, if we close the window when the app is still in the process of loading the images, we can see in the logs that the request is correctly cancelled, the queue is emptied and the finish callback is run, causing the application to close. And that's it for this tutorial. Remember to check out these videos if you are interested, and I will see you in the next one.